um, to join this community uh, a year ago. Uh, one of the big things that I heard from everyone is as we were experiencing the pandemic, still coming out of the pandemic, that the primary goal of this year was for us to reestablish a strong sense of community. And, uh, and that's really what we've been focused on. And I also, you may recall, if you watched the video that I shared at the um, back to school night uh, in the fall, I made you one promise, that it would be imperfect and amazing. And I think that that's kind of true. There's things that we've, we've learned because we've, it's been three years since we've had in-person events, that we've, you know, so we've, we've bumbled our way through getting, getting those muscles going again but we just so appreciate your understanding and partnership as we have gotten back to a much more normal experience here on campus. And I will tell you that from what I've experienced as the interim head, that the kids are having an amazing experience and it should never be perfect, right? There should be bumps along the way, there should be things that we're constantly learning, but I've been so amazed with how much, how much joy they bring every day and how much engagement they bring every day. Uh, and so tonight is about giving you a sense a broad sense from all of our constituents, from our PA president, who will actually take you through the agenda, from hearing from uh, the, the Parents Association, the board, uh, giving you some ideas and key metrics and data about the success of the school, talking a little bit more about program, hearing more from the students, uh, and then thinking about what is it, what, what are we looking ahead toward? Uh, and then we'll close with remarks from our incoming head of school, Rob Mundra. So we're really happy that you're here. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy hearing from all of our constituents. And I'm going to hand it over to Yvonne. Thank you, Katie. Good evening. So um, tonight, I hope to share with you uh, a general overview of how our parent community has been engaging and plans to continue to foster community. Y, um, buenas noches y bienvenidos. Aunque no voy a dar toda la charla en español, este, quería dar la bienvenida a nuestras familias hispanohablantes y decirles que es un gusto que estén con nosotros esta noche y también que son parte de nuestra comunidad. And as we know, um, Having a parent community here at Lake, at Lake Wilmerding means that we get engaged and we get involved. And I'm proud to share that this continues to be the case even after having gone through COVID. And that our parent volunteers continue to get involved and our families continue to attend events. And the parent engagement this year has been amazing. Our parent community has shown up with spirit and dedication and has shown in all our events, from sporting games to admission events, performances. The tiger spirit has been felt all around. Here are some examples. Um, over, we've had over 15 in-person events and we're actually trying to have a better gauge on how to keep a track of our events. We're working on that. Um, and some of the highlights have been, as you know, the Oracle Sports Boosters, Go Tigers. Mm -hmm. um, some performing arts season receptions. Uh, our fact staff appreciation events. Uh, and we also had here some uh, guest speakers, such as the, our, um, the author, Jaime Cortez, who came and uh, had an amazing uh, talk about his book, uh, Gordo. And we had a great uh, attendance there as well. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, we also had some uh, Zoom events, uh, and we had in conversation with uh, Dr. Susie Jang and journalist Lisa Ling. And uh, we continue uh, to connect through our PA, through groups such as the Book Club, uh, Knitting Club, our Sports Boosters, and um, Applause. So as you can see, we are still continuing to uh, connect, and we continue to do so. And we encourage all of you to please continue uh, reading The Parent Corners, The E-Tiger, to be engaged and up to date to our, our information. And uh, please uh, continue to be part of our amazing community and increase time together and strengthening friendships and connecting and making new friendships 
throughout our years to come and with that i think we were talk about what's coming up with also our affinity groups and they also continue to create community and here's a list of our active affinity groups and i'm not going to read them through but you can see here and they continue to create community as well and on the next slide our upcoming events uh, so I see you can see we're also going to continue to be very busy for the next year <laughs> for uh, our upcoming remainder of the year so again as you can see there are a lot of events that are coming up so please uh, continue to show up and continue uh, engaging in uh, the rest of the school year so I think with that I will pass it on to Kim Kim Drew and I am the board chair and I am so happy to be at an in-person event with the Parents Association. It's such a great um, treat after the last couple of years. I am going to, um, you know, excited to give you an update on what the board is working on this year and um, oh, sorry I'm on the right slide. Uh, so I thought uh, before I talk about what the priorities are for the board this year that I would start off with uh, just a quick refresh of what the role is of the board and what the key responsibilities are of the board. Um, in a nutshell, we really are guardians of the mission of the school. We hold the school in trust for future generations. We have three core responsibilities. Um, one is to really hire and evaluate and partner with the head of school. Um, and help the head of school to achieve their priorities and their goals. We also develop some institutional policies that guide the head of the school, head of school being very focused on the day-to-day -day operations of the school, the board looking out kind of more long-term. So an example of an institutional policy would be the strategic plan or a facilities master plan. And then the third is that, you know, the fiduciary responsibility, so we're responsible for ensuring the financial well-being of the school. Uh, and doing that in partnership with the head of school and with um, Jeanette, the CFO. Um, the good news there is that the school is in really strong uh, financial, on financial footing. <clears throat> the priorities for us for this year, I was looking at this earlier and just thinking about how, um, if I had to put a theme on, just this theme of transition. So the first bullet point, a big focus, you know, going back to last year, and this year has just been around onboarding and ensuring that Katie is supported to achieve all of her goals and that she has what she needs to be successful. Uh, and then we've also been really focused on laying the groundwork for Raj uh, and something that has been so interesting and I really um, admire you for this is, you know, he was hired in June and I mean, just between the visits and the meetings and really has been investing so much and working closely with the boards so that in July, he really hits, his, hits the ground running. Um, we've also really, um, this year, are reassessing and taking a deeper look at the strategic plan. The plan was adopted in 2020, in January of 2020, right before the pandemic. And so the board is investing time this year to look at the strategic plan and say, you know, what do we need to dial up? What are we dialed down? What needs to be added, removed there? Uh, and then have been focused on, it, every year the board has a board education program. This year it's around um, really deepening the board's DEI skills and doing that in a way we're applying it to the processes and policies of the board itself, um, mostly around governance. Um, and then really just a good um, housekeeping item for most boards is around <coughs> strengthening the ongoing risk monitoring and um, risk assessment procedures for the board. Um, I wanted to also quickly just make a plug for the strategic plan. So as I said, the plan was adopted in January of 2020 and later speakers will talk about work that's happening at the school related to the strategic plan. Uh, it's not too long if you're not familiar with it. I wouldn't be surprised uh, because you know it was adopted at a time and then we didn't hear a ton about it because of the pandemic. So really would encourage you to go to the website, download it, and just become familiar with the three threads. Um, the first one being really focused on um, the academic experience and really evolving the, our program, the comprehensive student experience, the program. The second thread being around how do we uh, intensify and expand 
what we already do really well to draw a very diverse student body, diverse community to lick, one that really represents all the different facets of the Bay Area. And then how do we provide the resources and the sense of belonging so that people thrive once they're in the lick community. And then lastly, <coughs> we all know that our faculty and staff are really the um, kind of the core and the essence, the heart of what makes a great lick education. And so the third thread is really around deepening uh, investing more in our faculty and staff so that we're attracting, retaining, and really providing avenues of growth for our faculty and staff. Go read more if any of that was interesting to you. <laughs> admissions really excited to, to be here with you all tonight and to share all of the wonderful things that um, uh, that our school has here and who we are I mean something that we should be celebrating so um, in admissions just kind of holistically right now we have 549 students 30% um, of them live outside of the city many of you here tonight don't live in the city so thanks for making it here tonight um, 65% identify as students of color. Um, there's more than 150 middle schools represented in, in our school, um, and 40% of which um, are not coming from independent schools. And so when we look at our public schools, our parochial schools, our Catholic schools um, in the area or across the Bay Area, um, almost or pretty close to half of our students are, are coming from those um, from those backgrounds. Finally, um, on average, students that are, our families that are enrolled through our flexible tuition program um, are paying around um, $18,000 for, for tuition. So something that we're really proud of um, as a school that we're able to support and make sure that um, this education, this experience is accessible to everyone regardless of what, um, what their background is or what their circumstances are. In particular, um, the, the brush um, there's a lot of brush parents in the crowd tonight. Um, you may know this from maybe your child um, speaking to you, or maybe they're not speaking to you as much anymore. Uh, but they're really excited to be here on campus. They have so much energy. They're bringing a ton to the community um, well beyond these numbers. But looking at these numbers, it kind of explains why, right? Um, again, 33% um, of them are enrolled through flexible tuition. 70% um, of them identify as, as students of color. Um, another uh, 73 middle schools represented. Again, um, the public parochial school background, about 40%, and then 35 um, households are, are multilingual. Um, so again, really diverse group of students um, that are adding a lot to our community, and I, and I feel that it's really felt on campus, their presence, um, for better or for worse. <laughs> but, they, um, they're doing a really great job. I'm really excited to see them playing in basketball games, and soccer games, um, and just being involved and engaged on campus. Finally, um, one of the things that, that we really look at um, is how do we continue to, to get better as a school and an institution? Um, and the opportunities for us um, may not come up as often as we would like, but that's a good thing. That's a good sign of a, of a healthy school. And so um, here um, I have attrition up here. So attrition is the percentage of students who decide to leave um, like after some amount of time. And so <laughs> right now, um, this past year, we're at 2.5% um, in, um, in the Bay Area. It's about at 3.5%. Um, statewide, it's closer to 8% um, and then nationally. Um, about eight and a half percent. So we're doing a really great job. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't um, areas in which we can improve, um, but I just wanted to showcase again how healthy um, we are as a school and institution and how well we are, we are doing and supporting our students um, every step of the way. I am gonna pass it over to Jeanette. Jeanette Moore, I have the 
proud honor of being the CFOO here at WIC. Um, I've been here for three and a half years, so I started right before the pandemic, good timing. Um, but really, I had great fortune of coming into a business office with people who had been here for quite some time. Um, I have a controller who's worked here for 17 years, an office manager who's been here for over 30 years. Um, it is a very well-oiled machine back in the business office, um, primarily because of the people that came before me. Um, but the success in fulfilling our mission here at the school really is impacted by the resources we have as a school. And we are really lucky to have um, resources to put on this amazing program. Um, so it is a great place to be a CFO. Um, I don't have the, you know, I have the opportunity to work with people to figure out how is it that we can make this work, where are we gonna find the money for that. And, and generally we, we do figure out a way. There's a lot of creativity to make things happen. Um, but during Eric Temple's tenure here, our financials were really strengthened. Um, so we really come on a decade of a very, very successful capital campaign that made for this amazing building um, I'm always amazed at you know the amount of money that we were able to raise and the pledges that came in and how everybody really fulfilled their pledge um, and really put us in this great shape that we're in today. Um, you know, before I jump into just a couple of slides, you know, our financial model is different than other schools. Um, as Davion mentioned, we actually have the most robust financial assistance program amongst our peer group. Um, we also have two programs that other schools in town don't have. We have a tech arts program that's spectacular. We have the Center for Civic Engagement. These are just other things that are part of our program that we fund, really showing that the mission of our school is supported very much by, by our budget um, and how we prioritize things. Um, at a very high level, no surprise, most of the money to fund our school comes from tuition. Uh, it's over 80% of uh, the revenue for here at the school. Brian's gonna speak more to the importance of the endowment and the annual fund. But as you'll see, that's really the bulk of the rest of our, of our funding. Um, we get a tiny bit of money from like interest on our you know, money in the bank and stuff like that. But we are not a school that has additional fees. You pay your tuition, and we're not coming back and saying, okay, now you gotta pay for lunch, you gotta pay for your uniform, you gotta pay for your books. It really is an all-inclusive model. Um, so the, it, the bulk of it really is you know, from tuition. And then no surprise, where does the money that tuition comes in go to pay for? Salary and benefits. It really is all about the people that we have here at the school. And salary and benefits are about 70% of our operating costs each year. Um, you know, inflation definitely has hit us just as it's hit everybody here in the room. Um, where has it really shown up the most? Um, our athletic program, surprisingly, our buses. To give you an idea, back in 2018-19, we spent about $80,000 a year on buses to get around town to the various games. Last year, it was over 200,000. Um, you know, we're still wanting the same number of games. It's just part of it is a new bus company came into town and took over everything, and so they just jacked up the prices, but then the fuel costs also have been um, transferred on to us. Um, no surprise, utilities have gone up quite a bit over the last year, and uh, food costs as well, um, just you know, the places you would expect for inflation to come in. Um, you know, I put up, you know, not too much information out there, I hope, but if anyone has follow-up questions just on the revenue and the expense side, please feel free to reach out. Um, the next slide here. Uh, the, the orange bar, tuition, where it is like stacked up to the other schools in, the ta in town, uh, non-parochial schools, um, where towards the bottom half of it, um, but really what you can't tell from this chart is that we are all-inclusive. Um, only a handful of schools um, in, the, in the city are an all-inclusive model. So uh, what you don't see there is the additional add-on costs. And when you're coming to a school and you get that admissions packet, you're not really thinking like, okay, what does this mean? You know, am I paying for lunch? Do I have to go down to uh, California Street every day and pick up my lunch or what have you? It's so nice that we have it all right here. Um, just to know, next week enrollment agreements will be going out for, for <laughs> next year as well. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, in truth, the increase Every year, you know, tuition gets increased. I know it is uh, it is talked about a lot on the on the soccer sidelines, basketball court. Um, almost all of our tuition increase goes to have uh, an increase in salaries for our faculty and staff and towards our flex program. Um, that is the, the bulk of our tuition increase. And on that, here is our endowment. Um, we have about a $65 million endowment here at the school. Um, it topped out at a little over 70 before uh, the volatility of the last year of the market. Um, 
it's nothing like um, some of the East Coast schools, like where Raj is coming from, but for the Bay Area, we actually have one of the highest endowments um, in the area. And on that, I'm going to pass it over to Brian. Hello, I'm Brian Driscoll, Director of Development. And I'd like to start off by just saying thank you. Thank you all who have supported the school for some of you for many years, some this year for the first time. Uh, the annual fund, as you can see by this chart, breaks it down. We have, uh, it's much like Jeanette's chart. Tuition covers the bulk and the annual fund and the drawing endowment covers the rest. So it's like 85, 15. The endowment is made up of gifts that have come over time. Those that have come before us, it's set up in a special fund. We draw 4% on them every year and with the trailing 12 quarter average. So, uh, you know, gifts to the endowment are the long term investments in the school. And again, they're there for the rainy day, they're there to protect us. The annual fund is what keeps the place going every day. We're not mm -hmm. in a capital campaign right now, so the annual fund is really the only way to give to the school. And um, we've done a great job. Heather Platt, uh, our fund manager works with a group of parent volunteers and they do an incredible job calling. We make a conscious decision to call over three quarters of the year. Those of you who come from independent schools, K to eight, a lot of times they'll do it in 30 days. We don't want it to be a transactional experience. We want to sit down and talk with you and have your, your philanthropy be transformational. These gifts, even though they get spent this year, they allow us to be who we are. Um, the annual fund supports the flexible tuition, the shops, the programs, the faculty salaries, the athletics, the arts, and it's a vital part of what we do. We couldn't offer many of these things if we didn't have it. And <coughs> as the costs grow, the annual fund has to grow every year too. Um, we have meetings with donors, as I said, and if you haven't been met with yet, don't worry. <laughs> we'll be in touch with you. Don't feel hurt. <laughs> it's done randomly, it's not something that we go to our best friends first. So we'll be coming to talk with you um, by April and we hope that you'll be generous and supportive as you have been. Um, it, the annual fund really provides for the future by keeping us strong today. And people give to organizations or institutions that meet needs, not have needs. And your gift to the annual fund is also a big vote of confidence in what we do every day. You know, there are lots of great causes out there, and when you make a decision to give to Lick, you're telling us and telling the faculty that you really believe in what's happening here every day, and that means a lot to us. Uh, over the last nine years, the annual funds increased 81%, so there's a lot to celebrate. Um, the annual fund grew during the campaign, which raised $28 million. And while it may seem like a big school, it's really not that big. And so that was an outstanding effort by, a, again, a great group of volunteers, an outstanding board leading the way, and we couldn't have done it without you. And we'll have some special projects in the next couple of years as we gear up for another campaign. So just something to keep in mind. And uh, we're just really grateful for all that you've done to help us. Um, the current families, as you can see, bear the lion's share of the support of the annual fund. This going to this thing? And, and that's how it should be, because the annual fund supports what's happening right now. You're the big beneficiaries. Um, you're giving to something that's going to make your child's experience better right away. That money will be put to good use and put to good use right now. Um, you know, you're giving in terms of the long term. Uh, it, it, you giving to liquid limiting helps us provide for more students to graduate and contribute to the greater good. So it is a long-term investment and proposition, and we're really grateful. Thank you very much.
this year, and she is the school's dean of faculty. And she is actually currently in Philadelphia at a diversity hiring fair. Uh, I'm actually flying on a red eye tonight to meet her there tomorrow to do some interviewing. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you got to see her face uh, as a new member of the community. And she would be normally doing this particular slide, but I'm stepping in. Um, and really what we wanted to make sure that you all could see another area of strength for Lick is the longevity of the faculty here. Uh, and what I have really uh, has been amazed me is that people are really intentional about being at Lick. You know, it is not just a job, but they're here because of the mission of the school and the values of the school. And what's amazing when you really talk to our faculty is how far they are willing to commute to be here. And I know some of you can relate to that. You know, how far your kids are willing to travel to be here and be part of this community. It's really tremendous. So if you really look at that, when it breaks down, you know, half of the faculty have over 20 years of experience. You know, that's incredible. Like, you know that your kids are getting a good experience in the classroom because these folks um, have been around and they're mentoring the younger faculty and they're helping them to grow. And so this is a point of pride for us as a school and we wanted to be able to share that statistic with you. So now we're gonna actually transition to the program side. And so I'm gonna invite Kate and Raquel and Dee to join me up here. Thank you. Everybody. It's nice to be here. Apologize for the soccer clothes. I just came for the, the pitch. We thought we would introduce ourselves first and we're going to take our inspiration from our Stuco exec presidents. My name is Kate Wiley. Um, I use she her pronouns. I think this is my 17th year um, at Lake Wilmerding. Uh, my role is uh, currently my first year as the Dean of Teaching and Learning. I came out of Dean of Students. Um, and I went to university as my high school. <laughs> <laughs> Go lit. Uh, <laughs> hi everyone, my name is Raquel Lipa Gomez. I go by she, her pronouns, and this is my seventh month, not really counting, but um, I'm a freshman here, and I am the new, oh, the, I'm Dean of Students, and um, I went to Lowell. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Dee Johnson, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Dean of Adult Equity and Inclusion. Um, I'm actually not from the US, I went to the United World College of the Atlantic in Wales. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the program, the curricular, co-curricular program, and a little bit about um, how we sort of see the strategic plan as something um, that we're trying to make lived. Um, so, as was sort of mentioned at the beginning of the evening, um, you know, we too, as an internal community, were all of our meetings were Zoom, were virtual for a long period of time. We were not gathering in person, um, and the strategic plan was launched, and we were excited about it. And then we sort of quick pivoted to um, learning how to teach remote. And so, coming into this year, this team, we three, including Allegria we're sort of wondering about how do we bring these two things together. The fact that, as Katie said, our charge is really to sort of um, sort of refine what that in-person community feels like um, and, and get back to that while also um, recognizing that this a strategic plan had been paused um, and that we needed to make some traction on it. And so what we decided to do was really bring these two things together. So as you can tell, we very intentionally borrowed all the language from the strategic plan. And what you have here is sort of what um, is an iterative thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the work that we're doing this year, but I will also um, let you know sort of where this is going. Um, and all of that to mean that this um, weaving of our vibrant learning community and sort of the different weaving aspects. So as you can see, we call it all weaving a portrait. Um, some of the principal work we're doing is both the portrait of a link educator, so what does it mean to be an educator here? We use that word very intentionally. Education happens in a lot of different ways. It is not exclusively classroom learning, and really getting people to sort of understand the value and the importance of their role as educators working in this school. You all are educators for your children at home. Um, uh, and we're also doing sort of the portrait of a graduate work, so what are we saying sort of when they walk across that stage? in May and June. Um, what will that graduate have sort of experienced? What type of community will they emerging from? What type of communities will they build when they leave? Um, we also are doing some other portrait work. One is connecting the community. Um, and we're doing some internal work there with the goal that it also sort of filters out with students and parents. 
And then also one sort of on our working relationships, right? Like what does it mean to get back in a meeting together in person when we haven't done that for three years? So we brought this together, um, and just to let you know that a lot of ways that this is happening, for example, our portrait of our graduate work um, is actually happening within academic, within our teaching departments. So they're actively doing that work right now. The portrait of a lick educator informs all of our faculty staff meetings. So this also has given us a vision and meaning and purpose for the time that we spend together as an adult community. Um, so we're both sort of building those muscles of community and we're making traction on the strategic plan. Our team tonight just wants to highlight a few of these for you um, in terms of what the actual, um, what we're trying to tackle and what this means sort of for the experience for, um, for educators and for students. So I'm gonna just talk in a little bit about um, the portrait of a like, educator and in particular as you can see, it's the strand of sort of deepening our foundation. So thinking about um, a lot of the charges, what have we been doing well? <laughs> and what do we wanna be interrogated, potentially revision? And so we're really sort of taking this year to really do three things. So the first thing, and, and you know, Katie has been so great about centering the mission with everything that we do. We opened with it tonight, and so we lead with that in our meetings. So one is sort of the mission-inspired values, and so we wanna to get to a place where we're, uh, we're using common language, common understanding, sort of a shared mutual um, framework for sort of what are our values as a learning community. Head, heart, and hands is a core part of our mission. And yet, what does that actually look like in a practice, right? How do those three things come together? Not as siloed, not as hands happens on the soccer pitch and head happens in the history classroom, but how do they come together? And so some of the work that we're doing right now is we're taking these sort of values and ideals and we're actually turning them into competencies. How do we know when that practice is happening? How do we measure it? How do we evaluate it? How do we scaffold it? How do we build on it? Um, we're also sort of looking at sort of what we're saying is the, the mission-inspired program. So one of the charges of the strategic plan for us to think about as educators is how do we amplify the reality that teaching and learning happens in a lot of places. So how are we making more space for social justice and anti-racist work, for our public purpose work? So we're, students are seeing the extension, and, and our teachers are seeing the extension, is sort of what we, we talk about and what we say we're doing with doing it. Um, and then thirdly, um, we're really moving towards um, a more sort of integrated teaching and learning philosophy. It's another charge of the strategic plan. Um, and what that means is, is, again, is how do we sort of break down the walls about discipline specific, and how do we start sort of integrating the teaching and learning? Um, and so one of the things that we really want to start to look, about, look at is how can we sort of sponsor and build and find space for educators to collaborate so we start to have cross and multi and interdisciplinary courses and offerings um, in ways that are bringing head hearts <laughs> and hands together for the, for the kids. Um, and frankly, I think that actually is, is better teaching. So is it, right now for this year, these are sort of some of the things that we're working on. I'll talk a little bit at the end about sort of what that actually looks like in a systems practice, but these are sort of some of our value orientations for the portrait of an educator. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about the Lick graduate. So the in terms of leaving a portrait, um, what are we doing with our Lick grad with our Lick students and educating them for life? So at Lick, um, Kate already talked about this, but educating the whole person through our head, heart, and hand philosophy. Um, we're dedicated to nurturing, to fostering a nurturing environment where our students develop into lifelong learners who are equipped with the knowledge, empathy, and skills to make meaningful contributions to the world um, with confidence and compassion. And we heard that from our mission statement. And the values that are coming from the portrait of an educator work that Kate also spoke to um, are translating into the competencies that we are um, going to want to see for our graduates. Um, we're aligning those shared values as learning community. Um, but as all of you know, um, learning, teaching and learning doesn't just happen in the classroom. Um, we want our students to be known, supported, and cared for, whether that's through advising, peer connect, um, community events, or in um, community meetings where we're fostering empathy, inclusion, and sense of belonging. With the goal of centering our students and amplifying their voices, we're empowering our students to grow into compassionate and collaborative leaders. We listen to student perspectives and implement educational initiatives centered on the topics that they name as important. Um, this year alone, we've offered programming on consent and healthy relationships, harm reduction approaches to substance use, and promoting our ethnic <coughs> studies program. 
Um, we're consistently providing our student leaders with training and leadership opportunities. And this past December, we had six students attend our uh, attend the Student Diversity and Leadership Conference. And this past Tuesday, 13 students attended the Patina Love Special um, Student Event Conference at Woodside Priory. Um, our school also places um, emphasis on community service and public service as part of our mission. And that's something that really drew me to the school. Giving our students the opportunity to participate in service through PPP classes and standalone opportunities can be a valuable experience for them. And so it teaches them the importance of giving back to the community and helps them develop a strong sense of social responsibility. I had a really rewarding time with some of our 10th graders. Um, we went to El Dorado um, Elementary School and got to help out with snack, um, recess, and tutoring. Um, in the fall, we had a few students who helped host Lake Wolverine's first mental health benefit. They partnered with the center and also with the counseling department to raise awareness, education, and resources while showcasing some of our students' talents and treasures. All of the proceeds from that event went to um, the Green Lake Clinic. And um, something else that I also wanted to highlight was the TEDx event that's being hosted in April by um, AJ Nasser. Um, and that theme is Insight, Impact, and Innovation, where students from LIC will have the opportunity to share their stories and how they plan to make a positive impact on the world. Um, this event has generated a lot of excitement with our community members, um, but those are just a few ways to, um, a few things to highlight that what our students are doing um, with service and community engagement as a way to give back, make a positive impact, and foster a sense of purpose. Um, another thing that we're really trying to focus on, like Katie said, was having that imperfect and amazing year. Um, and so we're really trying to infuse joy into the day-to-day -day with our students. Um, student Council is doing a really amazing job, so I want to give a shout out to them. Um, because they're really listening to the needs of the students and listening to wanting to know what they want to do in terms of making those milestone memories that they might not have been able to do because of um, COVID. Um, the, um, they're emphasizing community, having fun, and slowing down. And the emphasis on slowing down is also really important to help counterbalance the stress and pressures that come from school and extracurricular activities that some of our students may be experiencing. Um, overall, the student, uh, student council and student life team are doing a great job, I think, of bringing back joy and school spirit. We can hear them in the gym right now, um, but it's been really awesome to, to feel it. Um, and lastly, you know, we're, we all aspire for our students to be prepared for life beyond LIC. Um, we hope that one day they'll be able to look back at their time here with all those fun memories um, of grade level competitions, um, the TGIF stances, socials, and other defining moments of high school that are all really integral aspects of their, of being a vibrant community. It's my pleasure this evening to share briefly about our work to hold our community members across all walks of life in deep, rich care. As you all know, the past three years have been rather difficult. We've been together apart um, through multiple pronounced pandemics, distance learning, and other forms of isolation. So naturally, we wanted to have a reset. And so as a community, we decided to focus our attention on compassion, communication, communal care, and collaboration as our themes for the year, as Kate mentioned earlier. We committed to asking ourselves how, through our people, programs, and practices, would we challenge ourselves to be better together once again. We leaned into our values of wellness, equity, and belonging, and leveraged our learnings from the pandemic. Um, and there were several, <laughs> particular continued interrogation of our use of time and designed experiences that would allow us to come together with intention, with care for our most underserved and underrepresented at the fore. We intentionally designed an onboarding process that allowed for FAC staff to learn more about the school, their respective departments and teams, while also allowing for the cross-pollination of ideas across disciplines. We created a more robust and mission-aligned arc for adult meetings, as previously mentioned, added more opportunities for celebration. We needed more joy um, and dialogue, both in and across affinity groups, through the PA, through our student affinity groups, and through work through our anti-racist faculty group, as well as created opportunities for folks to challenge themselves even further through deep anti-racist and other forms of self-work and healing. We also have met student and family support, fact staff recruitment, hiring and retention with renewed fervor. We continue to deepen our commitment to being student-centered 
with the rich work of our student support services team led by raquel and we've put in place processes that allow us to support the diverse language needs of our families through offering interpretive and translation services in spanish mandarin and cantonese at community-wide events and through the hosting of our second annual latinx open house and admissions event that is run completely in spanish we have also made significant progress towards improving the access of our latinx families to the that they have to the academic and co-curricular programs at our school through actually one-on-one -on -one engagement in spanish language and this is specifically important considering that we've set a, a goal of 25 percent of our student body identifying as latinx we've also continued to advance our commitment to reaching our desired goal of 40 percent of our student body receiving flexible tuition which is really important given the high cost of living in the bay area and as it concerns fact staff recruitment hiring and retention we continue to build partnerships with seasoned recruitment firms that specialize in the recruitment of diverse candidates we also continue to cultivate relationships with historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, other BIPOC community organizations, as well as Hispanic serving institutions, HSIs. We offer very robust compensation packages that inc include competitive salaries and immaculate benefits. And as a senior leadership team, we've begun the work of interrogating just how we can be more creative in holding our faculty in deeper care given the high cost in the Bay Area and the generational turnover in our faculty as well. So we also continue to support professional learning and development with an impressive PD budget that has allowed both students and adults in our community to grow in the areas of DEI, socio-emotional learning, and of course, in their teaching and learning leadership. Back to you, Kate. So before I bring up um, George and Olivia, you're gonna come back up. So this is just a little um, sort of timeline to give you a sense of, I mean, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is some sort of iterative work. Um, and, um, you know, we're trying to sort of plan out at least through 2025, which was the original benchmark, right, with our strategic plan. Um, so currently this year, like as I said, the portrait of a graduate work is happening in our teaching departments. Um, that will be, we will be expanding as we move into next year in the portrait of educators and forming all of our sort of larger faculty and staff um, meeting times. What we're now looking to for next year is specifically the portrait of a, of a graduate um, because um, there are multiple stakeholders, of course, with that and what that might potentially mean. And so we're going to take it from departments to cross-departmental, so right, starting to get at again, what are the shared values, what's our shared language, um, how can we be sort of sharing best practices across department. We're gonna be uh, launching student sessions. So students are gonna be contributing to the portrait work. Um, where, are, where is what they think aligned with what the teachers think or where is it not aligned? Um, and we're also gonna be doing family sessions. So there are gonna be sort of workshop formats where we're gonna be offering times for families to come. Um, and it'll be you know, co-led by a team of us where we will lead families through activities and exercises to get their sort of um, thoughts about and what they're experiencing as being a part of that right portrait of a graduate um, constituencies. 2023-25, what part of why we're also doing this sort of foundational portrait work is we feel fundamentally that the strategic plan charges us to have some conversations, right? Um, to have some conversations like Dee was saying about how we use time. Um, and you know, time, what, what, how you use your time is what you value. So does the way that right now we have a schedule, our academic calendar, is that, is that saying this is what we value? And so we wanna do an interrogation of that, our graduation requirements. Right. So are we saying, right, this is meeting sort of the education of the strategic plan and the initiatives, the sort of the mandates there, as well as what we imagine a student now graduating from a high school in 2025 is going to is going to sort of be needing to do. Um, and so to do that sort of systems work, we wanted to start with the foundational values work. Right, so those systems should come out of, so once this entire community, including the teachers, and we arrive at those shared value language, then we feel like we can then begin some of those conversations about how we use time. And students talking about feeling overwhelmed and overloaded, and how do we sort of build an, a curricular to co-curricular experience that is driven by values, but then where those systems are actually living the values. So that's sort of the direction that we are heading in um, over the course of the next three years, and there will be ample space and, in fact, encouragement and needed for both parents' families as well as for students to be involved and be intersecting with the work. So, 
George and Olivia, I turn it over to you soon. talk about a few different student council positions, our goals, and our some of our glows and grows from the year. Okay. Um, these are just a few of the positions. Something that we want to highlight is the environmental chairs, Natalie and Bruno, and this is actually a new position that we've never had before at LIC, um, which is really cool. And then we also have class reps. So we have executive council, which was the last slide, and class reps. Um, and there's three per grade. OK, so these are some of our goals as a student council that we established at the beginning of the year that have been carrying our projects and working towards. So our first one is bring back school spirit. As many of our presenters before us touched on, COVID had a big hit on our community. And we wanted to acknowledge that. A lot of students were feeling disconnected from their friends, from other grades, and we really wanted to work on bringing back that energy. That energy that really describes Lick students, that passion, that passion for learning, for coming to school, to enjoying the day, wanting to be with your friends, making those connections. So that was our primary goal, and I think so far we've been doing a good job, personally. <laughs> um, our second goal was to continue our work with the Ethnic Studies and Anti-Sexual Assault and Harassment Working Group. Um, George and I both um, co-founded the Anti-Sexual Assault and Harassment Working Group, and we're now working on Samahar Days of Justice, which is a conference with a keynote speaker, different workshops, and where students will get to learn about different things that um, revolve around an anti-sexual assault and harassment. We are also working on networking with admin to amplify student voice. One thing that we recognized was that there was a, a gap in the bridge between admin and student voices. So as co-presidents, we've been working on bridging that communication personally through student council with each separate constituent group and their projects. We kind of act as a liaison with the admin and also just as we were saying in our previous board meeting this week, also inspiring students to do their passion projects, really going out and doing what they want to do, and with the help of, oh, I need the support of this adult. This adult does this thing. I can go and reach out to them. OK, some of our glows has been the community meetings and the grade level games. They're actually new this year, and it's such a fun experience at community meeting. I haven't remembered anything like that since our freshman year. And it's also not just the grades. FAC staff are actually runner-up right now. They're actually doing really well in the games. And it's a <laughs> no, seniors are up. <laughs> but um, it's a super fun way of gathering our community. Um, and also, as someone mentioned before, the consent programming um, that the counselors have spearheaded after the um, anti-sexual assault and harassment working group has really started those conversations. Yes, and some of the just brief events that we've hosted, a Haunted House, Health, Health Dance, TGIF, BIPOC, Frosh, Social, Spirit Week, and then some bigger things like we have the spotlight during community meetings that's like really highlighting student voices, going up to students, just kind of interviewing them on their experience of like it's a thing that brings the community together. Like you get to hear from a freshman that you haven't met before and that maybe now that you see them walking around, you'll say hello. There's also Chase Center and the pep rallies. We're trying to bring back that energy, like we said. We saw a huge turnout at Chase Center. We took up, I think it was three sections. University only took two. Sorry, that's why. It's cool. Yeah, we won. <laughs> In spirit. And also, uh, another avenue that we're communicating with the student body is through our Stuco Instagram. And just a quick shout out. Charlotte would not forgive me if I did not do a Stuco shout out, which is LWHS at LWHS.stuco. Or just Stuka. One of those two. We're on Instagram. We communicate through that. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, we're currently planning Samahara Days of Justice, and we're also just really want to make sure we communicate to the student body and are transparent, and also transparent in our meetings with various ad administration on what the students really need and what change we want to see. Um, we're also really focusing on advisory. There's a lot of student feedback that we have advisory too much, or it's inequitable, and some teachers just play games, some actually do the work, so we're working right now with Ms. Titus and 
that it's not actually how many times we do advisory month, it's more like how we're meaningful and what we do with the time in advisory. So that's something we're gonna work on surveying. Um, we also love our no homework free weekends. So <laughs> we're gonna try and work on planning those more intentionally, maybe like next year around when college, college work is super heavy for seniors, different things like that. We wanna start intentionally planning those weekends. Yes, and one big project headed by our environmental chairs, which is the new position, is food waste in the dining hall. So obviously there's gonna be leftovers after lunch, and so one project that they're spearheading right now is reducing that waste. So they're being very intentional, creating the path for future positions. And another thing that we're currently looking forward to is winter formal. So that's coming up in the end of February. So we're all very excited about that. It'll be a chance for the whole school to be together besides our all school dance house. We will also have prom, which we're both excited as seniors. And yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. The, uh, the student leaders here at LIC are incredibly motivated and one of the things that I really appreciate about the program and how we support student leaders is that we as the adults don't try to do it for them. Um, and you know that they really are given a lot of autonomy to, to say this is what's important to us, to figure out how to solve some of the problems and with our support um, and also to, to struggle with that, right? There's, it's not easy sometimes and, uh, and so I am very appreciative to the amount of work George and Olivia have done this year. They've had a huge impact, so thank you both. Um, so we're, we're, this is sort of the last little segment. We're just thinking about looking ahead. And, uh, and so then we're also, at the end, we'll leave some time for some questions. So if there are some things that you feel like we haven't talked about or you want us to explain a little bit more detail, uh, we'll have a chance to take a few questions. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to want to let people go home. And, <laughs> I'm going to say this now because I'm thinking of it, and catch the end of the boys' basketball game. <laughs> They've been struggling with their fourth quarter play. They've been that they haven't been playing great in the fourth quarter, and so they could use a little like help at the end. So if you don't have to rush out, stop by the gym. We might that energy might help our our basketball team. Um, so you know, looking ahead, these are just a couple of points that uh, we want to make sure that you're all aware of. Uh, I'm going to talk first about what's what's next for COVID, and I'll just say, as as the head of interim head of school, I hear both ends. Right? I hear the people who are saying, please don't ever stop testing, please keep the masking going, and I hear people on the other side saying, why are we still testing? You know, can we stop with the required mask? So we know that our community is split on this. And, um, and so you know, we've really looked at the data, uh, and, we're, and, I, and so we've had over 16,000 COVID tests that we've logged this year alone. Um, and it's a less than 1% positivity rate. In fact, uh, a higher percentage of our COVID positives come through asymptomatic testing that people are doing midweek and not on Sunday night, which is an interesting statistic. Um, and so th the reason that I share this with you now is not to say we've made any decision, but I think it's time for us to start to think about letting go of some of these, these um, pro processes. And I know that that will be hard for some members of the community. We, we have to talk about it internally. We have to really look at the data. We're gonna talk to the schools that haven't been testing all year. What have they been seeing in terms of COVID rates? Uh, and we'll be bringing the task force back together uh, to look at this. So it's important for us to start to just pre be prepared that um, at some point we will stop testing for COVID. Uh, and I think while that may seem obvious, uh, you know, and we, I'm not giving a timeline to it right now. I just want to make sure that people are aware um, that, that that will come at some point. Uh, and, but we want to do it well, we want to do it thoughtfully, we want to do it based on the science. Um, and then we will obviously continue to provide tests um, and we will ask people to test symptomatically. So it'll be optional testing with our optional masking. Um, so, but back to the other things. Um, some of you may or may not know, we are in the process of a website redesign for this year. That's a very intense process. Uh, and we're really excited about that. Adriana Delgadillo, who is not here, she's our Director of Communications, is leading that uh, team. And so just be aware that this spring, we're really hoping uh, we'll be able to launch before the end of the year. But you know, as these things go, we, you know, we'll see how it goes. But that's going to be great for us to have a, a different platform and a different visual and design behind the story that we want to tell about LIC. 
Uh, and I'll just say that right now, the website is set up to serve lots of constituents. Uh, it's sort of trying to serve parents and prospective families and admissions families and faculty and staff. And so we're really trying to solve for that uh, through this redesign. We're also going to be launching student emails uh, next year so that they will have Lick Wilmer Learning High School email addresses, um, which is a really important thing uh, for, for kids to have a professional email address. Uh, and that will allow us actually to be able to do better internal communication with our students. Um, we're also going to be doing a parent survey this spring. That's not something that we have traditionally done, but that's going to be really good data for the team and for Raj coming in uh, to hear from our parents about all the different areas uh, of the school, strengths, opportunities, I like to call it opportunities, um, that we want to be able to focus on as we think about the next several years. Uh, and then finally, obviously, there'll be a lot of focus on welcoming Raj and, and uh, his, his leadership. So I'm going to hand it back over to Kim. So, thank you. I am, uh, just for very quickly, uh, I'm very excited to formally introduce Raj uh, Mundra tonight. Raj was um, selected, we went through a, um, I was going to say a national, but an international uh, search process uh, and uh, we're just so excited and unanimous uh, the search committee in choosing Raj he was announced last June I think I said that earlier and uh, there are so many things about Raj through the process that really resonated with the committee with the search committee but a couple things that really stood out from so many other candidates was just his uh, real dedication to academic excellence. He comes to us from um, Andover, which I know some of you know this, but I, I think there are some new families in the room who may not know all of this about Raj's uh, background. He comes to us from Andover, where he's been for 20 plus years. He's currently the deputy head of school there. And um, there's so many things, in, in what I was just starting to say was that just the, um, was your title before Dean of, you, Dean, yes. And so just this deep, deep, passion and dedication for academic excellence um, was something that we were really excited about and really stood out from so many other candidates, as well as um, his passion for the Public pur Purpose Program. Um, he can talk about either tonight or other times um, about some of the programs that are similar to our Public Purpose Program here that he uh, put in place and expanded upon at Andover. Uh, and then lastly, just his real commitment uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, and those practices and, and some of the, the uh, programs that he put in place around that at Andover. So just really, really thrilled and excited. Um, when, when we announced you, it felt like a year was so long away. Now it feels like it's, it's really soon. So just super excited that you're here and um, would love for you to say a couple of things. some observations um, in my, my short time of getting to know the community and what I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm really grateful to be a part of a community uh, that aligns its commitment um, with its mission, its programming, and daily practice. Um, and it's authentic. It's a high level of integrity that the school walks talk and so that means a lot to me um, and I'd like to thank a few groups um, the board um, and Kim for their short and long-term leadership um, Eric Temple and Katie Titus uh, who have led the school in these challenging times uh, these past few years really placing the health and well-being of students and adults um, at the forefront of all of their decisions the faculty uh, staff and students um, who are curious, creative, innovative, work hard, care for each other. Um, this is what I've seen, and they bring the best, their best selves into this community um, every day, this diverse, inclusive learning community. Um, I want to thank uh, the parents, guardians, caregivers um, that I have met. Um, it's so clear your 
sacrifices and commitment to a holistic education for your children um, is deep. Uh, your partnership with the school is essential. Um, and it's essential for both of us to see your kids discover themselves and learn more about the world. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the alumni and friends of Lake um, who support our community in so many um, sort of behind uh, the scene sorts of ways. Uh, there is a large community uh, that really shares its love uh, about what's happening here. <clears throat> I look forward uh, to joining the community this summer and building on the many strengths of um, the program. Um, and I'm going to just list a few. Access um, to this incredible education, this privilege that we have um, for the kids here. Um, the, you know, continuing to prioritize that in the, this diverse, inclusive learning community, that everyone feels like they belong and that their journey is a healthy one. We work so hard to attract the best educators and provide them with the resources to deliver our amazing academic curriculum um, and our incredible technical arts program. And finally, a, a, a real uh, authentic commitment um, to share our resources to meet our mission of being a private school with a public purpose. Uh, this is something that resonates deeply with me and connecting head, heart, and hands um, in, all, in all that we do. Um, I'll end um, just by sharing um, sort of my initial observations on what I believe um, a successful student at Lick um, looks like, um, or, how, or how they will succeed, why they will succeed. I think a student at Lick succeeds here um, because we have a strong sense of belonging. We prioritize student well-being, and we know that students will be engaged with their learning. Trust, care, and curiosity. Um, these build day after day, semester by semester, year after year. <coughs> you can see two of our examples here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so proud of every single kid um, at the school. It's one piece of great advice um, that I've heard. I've heard a lot of great pieces of advice, um, but I want to share one um, that I've heard uh, from a parent. A parent said, keep the funk at Lick. <laughs> <laughs> and so I will do my best. I'm so excited, and I look forward to getting to know you better soon. Thanks. clarity about the future of the academic program? Um, so I think to answer one part of your question, I think coming um, sort of coming back into first cohort and then full school, um, the sort of resounding question that I was hearing from students um, was what's the purpose of this? Um, because they had just lived through something quite significant. It wasn't lost on them that it was quite significant. I mean, even in California with wildfires, it's not lost on them. And so a lot of the question was sort of, what, what's the purpose of this? And you know, they weren't trying to be so esoteric. Um, and yet, I think what they were also asking for is it's like, we, we love the learning and we love the classes and, and we want it to be imbued and connected 
apart from this one discrete experience that I'm having. Right, so I have this relationship with this teacher and we study this one thing, but I've also heard it a little bit talked about over there, but I don't see them like mirrored together. And so one of the, one of the things that we're realizing is that we'll, where we can be better in terms of the academic program is not just for them to feel like um, the purpose is living both within and beyond the classrooms and that that is a shared purpose. We're transparent about it, we talk about it, the kids know what it is, the teachers know what it is, but also that, um, that their sort of multi-skill set that they're bringing to different classes is maximized in lots of different places. And so that's why in terms of where we want to see the academic program go, um, is really thinking about the kids as 3D people, mm -hmm. and so their learning needs to be 3D. And so it's breaking down those walls of this is how you do it in science, and this is how you do it in history, and this is how you do it with PPP, and it says be like actually, science is preparing you for this other aspect in history, and we're bringing PPP in as a school, as a community together, so kids are having this very 3D experience of their education because what that purpose comment from them really was also saying is that they were feeling siloed. Um, and I think it had, had been present. I think the pandemic just exposed it. And so I think to borrow from Katie, this is a great opportunity. We already had a charge of a strategic plan. We had a charge to think about what is the next iteration of education look like. And for us to be one of the few high schools that has like a department of interdisciplinary studies where we are talking about collaborative teaching and we are talking about where tech arts can be melded with history and melded with the center in one or two courses, um, I think is the direction that we're going in. I think it's what the world needs. I think it's the skill sets our students have. And that's what we're looking to do from this values work. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm Heather McCullough. My, my son's a freshman here, Prash. Um, I'm just curious if you, um, Katie and Raj, can tell us a little bit about the transition process and the onboarding. I know so much of it's already been going on, but as new parents, sometimes we don't see all that. So maybe you just can walk us through it a little bit. And I want to preface that with thank you so much to both of you for your leadership. Yeah, you know, I'll just talk about my experience. You know, I think that the the, um, the senior admin team here is incredibly strong, right? So while we did welcome three of us new into the community this year with Raquel, myself, and, and Alegria, we also had a foundation of strength uh, here on the all admin team that actually made it really easy uh, to really hit the ground running. Um, so from my experience, because the team was so strong, uh, it really made the transition quite seamless. Uh, and you know, right now, obviously, we're focused on making sure that the handoff is, is also seamless. Uh, and so I can let Raj talk a little bit more about that, but he's become my best friend. <laughs> we talk all the time. We text, you know. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I've, I've been really impressed with the transition. Uh, certainly, Katie and I um, speak regularly um, about the program. Um, there, I'm also, there's a transition team from the board um, that's helping with um, the, trend, you know, the, the logistics and uh, getting me up to speed on all the documents and the history and the spirit of Lake. Um, this is my um, fourth visit um, to campus. Um, and so every time I um, visit campus, I learn more about the school and perspectives. Um, I've got a full-time job right now also, um, and so I'm sort of attending to that. And so uh, I feel really good. I also support, and I feel so fortunate to be coming into a very strong team and a very strong program and values that just really align with me at a deep personal level. And so um, the transition is going really well. Um, in June, I will come here for a retreat with the senior administrative team and to sort of look at setting goals for next year. And then um, my wife and I will move out towards the end of June. Um, and I'll start July 1st. Um, and then we'll work our way through the summer um, and then get ready for the school year. Um, but it's been a pleasure to meet with kids, have really good conversations with kids and faculty and now starting to get to know some parents also. Um, I do feel a lot of love coming into this community and that feels really nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm Vanessa Clark, I'm a freshman mom. This is for Raj. Um, 
what are three specific goals you have for the school? Thanks. So, um, one would be to um, continue to live the mission of the school. Um, so, again, what I said is so important to me is access to the program, um, to, to have a diverse, inclusive learning community. This is, this is not easy work. Um, th there's a lot of hard work that has gone on um, intentionally short and long term um, in order to help Lick become the place that it is. And so continuing you know, with that. Um, I have a deep um, sort of set of values around service and citizenship, um, as well as a strong academic program. And so really taking a look at our PPP program, uh, really taking a look at what Kate was saying in terms of interdisciplinarity um, and cross culture and cross uh, competencies um, is going to be really exciting work. Uh, I think for me, um, I will need a little bit of time to first get here um, and then to sort of understand the needs of the community um, and understand how different parts of the community come together. Um, and so that we can have shared action, um, collective action together. And so um, I'm taking you know, my cues for short-term goals from Katie and the team here. Um, I mean, long-term you know, long sort of goals with the board, um, but I feel um, really good about uh, coming here and listening and learning um, and then developing a set of strategies. Thank you for your time tonight, for being part of this. And again, I'll remind you that we will send a survey that will come out in a week and a half at the, uh, now for the, for the E-Tiger. We hope you will give us some feedback. <coughs> we want to learn from this experience so that next year we'll do it even better. Um, and I do hope that you'll think about stopping by that basketball game too. Right now, right at the end of that fourth quarter. So thank you all so much for being here. Today. Yeah. Press the red button again and it'll stop. Okay.